Hi, this is Kalandra Cruikshank, founder and CEO of Statebook International. Thank you so much for joining the Disruptive Real Estate Tech webinar uh, with IEDC. Nice to have you with us. And um, I think we'll just give it one more minute for people to uh, join. I think maybe we're waiting for a couple more and then we'll get started. Thank you so much. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, I think we're good to go. Um, again, I'm Kalandra Cruikshank, founder and CEO of Statebook International, and greatly appreciate having you on for the Disruptive Real Estate Tech presentation. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit today about innovative solutions for communities and how you can uh, prepare yourselves to support the companies of the future, what those companies are looking for, and how disruptive real estate tech is kind of changing the game for real estate altogether. So I'm going to uh, just get started. And I think one thing that we can all agree, um, whether it's related to disruptive real estate tech or how companies are looking at locations and where they want to focus their attention. Right now, today, everything is revolving around finding locations where they can attract and retain creative skilled workforces. And so if you start to think about how technology starts to impact that, hang on one second, I am trying to advance the slides. There we go. Now it's working. <laughs> okay, um, so we're sort of at this stage of perfect disruption in the industry right now, where technology is uh, is evolving at an unprecedented rate with things like cloud computing, leaner, faster coding, mobile devices, smaller and cheap sensors that are available to companies and also to commercial real estate and communities for monitoring all kinds of things in your communities. And all of that is enabled through basically unlimited connectivity with broadband, Wi-Fi, 4G, now 5G coming. And we have, we're seeing an increasingly tech savvy and mobile workforce. And this workforce is demanding new applications and new ways of doing work and new um, workforce environments. And we're also looking at, as a result of what employees are seeking, we're seeing companies seek more vibrant areas where they can really offer live, work, play scenarios that their employees are demanding that include creative energy and provide an offering of a mix of housing, shopping, offices, culture and entertainment, walkability and transit options. And all of this is sort of being enabled by startups that are increasingly, um, well, they are increasing, the number of startups is increasing and they are also increasingly being acquired. And the entire uh, process is, being funded by a rapidly increasing pool of creative capital. So if you think about the fact that the workforce is changing dramatically, 35% um, of the workforce was non-employee in 2015, and it is anticipated that that will be 40% by 2020. Uh, you can start to see that a lot of these trends are impacting how companies are going to be looking for space and what kinds of space they're looking for. Millennials now make up uh, a share of the U.S. workforce that is equal to baby boomers at 25%, and that is expected to grow to 45% of, of the workforce being comprised of millennials by 2025. At the same time, millennials are moving increasingly, both millennials actually and baby boomers are moving increasingly into urban areas and that trend is expected to grow. So you can see here from 1950, 
um, to now and then out into the future, almost to 2050, looking forward, um, rural pop populations are expected to stay roughly the same while urban populations are expected to grow dramatically. And that is increasing, uh, increasingly having an impact on workforce trends. So if you think about the fact that um, about 3 million people are moving into cities each week worldwide, and about 54% of people live in cities, which is up from 30% in 1950, actually going back to this chart, um, you can see how that works. And it's expected to be about two thirds of the world population in the next 15 to 30 years will be in urban areas. And more than half of urbanites actually live in cities of 500,000 or more. And there are already up to 53 megacities of more than 10 million people. So if you then think about the fact that there are about 468 cities with a population of a million or more, which is up from 83 in 1950, you'll see that 10% of the planet's land by 2030 or approximately 20,000 football fields, according to Yale, will be made up of uh, city populations. So what that means for, um, whoops, wrong direction. What that means for workforce trends is you've got an increasingly tech savvy and mobile workforce. They are looking for urbanization and surbanization, um, which indicates that uh, it's sort of a, a snazzy way to say that they would like to have a w live work play environment whether they're living in rural communities suburban communities or urban communities they really want to have access to everything they want in one local place and they are much more diverse and diversity tolerant and also um, much more actively participating in the sharing and on-demand economies, which are growing dramatically. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So as it relates to real estate, as Chris Kelly, the co-founder of Convene, which is one of those disruptive tech startups, uh, said, what talent wants, landlords need, and developers must build. So if you think about that in the context of our conversation, I think it'll help to tie it all together. So if you look at this chart, this is showing how the actual um, funding for, this is venture funding for from looking back to 2011 to today. And this is looking at what um, venture funds have invested. And you can see that it's up from about 350 million in 2011 to nearly 13 billion last year. So the venture community is increasingly engaged in this industry and helping it to grow. Here are just a handful of the venture funds that are sort of um, both bigger names in this industry. And also if you look at JLL Spark, Collier's Prop, Prop Tech Accelerator, Techstars partnering with Collier's, Techstars partnering with people like Target, um, they're really starting, the commercial real estate firms are really starting to get into this um, action and they're making bets and big bets trying to participate in order to keep their finger on the pulse of the innovation that is happening around them with them in many cases and if they're not careful to them. And if you think about this cool term, I love this term, this is real estate fracking so real estate fracking is a term frequently used in presentations by Steve Weichel, who sits on my state board, state book board of directors. Um, and Steve is the head of disruptive real estate tech for MIT. And real estate fracking is a term coined by Professor Dennis Frenchman at MIT. And it means basically using technology to break real estate apart and then put it back together into something more productive, thus unlocking an overlooked asset value. So if you think about this um, quote here by Mark Grinnis, the head of real estate for EY, commercial real estate is no longer a fixed asset, it's fluid. 
And I love this quote because um, companies used to take leases for 40 years, and now it's 10 years or fewer. And they're watching workforce trends, and employees are moving between jobs every few years. Um, very few millennials stay with a company like IBM used to have, you know, IBM lifers. And very few millennials are going to have that kind of an experience. They're, they're skipping jobs every couple of years. They're moving fast. They're responding to both changing technology and the increasing demand for their skills. And um, they're also demanding an, a different kind of quality of work environment and quality of life. And so it's meaning that companies are changing the way that they do business. And instead um, of taking very long-term leases and, and being good partners in communities, increasingly we're seeing them reassess their real estate footprints and their really examining their occupancy levels and looking at hard, do hard dollar ROI that gets achieved by allowing some people to work from home or at least have more fluid office space that can be shared. And uh, of course, even directly leasing from WeWork and other co-working space providers. So if you think about what this means for your communities, um, it's an interesting time to start to think about, you know, whether your regulatory and permitting processes are streamlined enough to enable companies to get up and running faster so that they can be more responsive to their workforce and their own uh, footprint needs, and to rethink incentives which are geared toward long-term long corporate partners. And lots of other things that kind of go into how you work with corporates, with site selectors, et cetera. So these are two very familiar examples of real estate fracking, WeWork and Airbnb, and they're really helping to rethink what real estate means. Um, up until recently, neither of them owned any of the real, real estate that they were leasing and renting out, um, whether for business purposes in WeWork's case, or for vacation purposes in Airbnb's case. Um, now WeWork is starting to acquire some of the real estate that they work with, um, but certainly that is still a very small minority of their process and, and their model. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves over time. Um, but if you think about just how co-working demographics have changed, it's very interesting because um, we have here, you can see how freelance and independent workers used to make up the majority, the brighter top red line is the uh, 2010 data, and the darker red line is 2017. So freelancers and independent workers used to make up the majority of co-working spaces. And now you can see that actually employees at large firms with, in this case, in this graphic from Recode, um, employees with firms with more more than 100 employees are starting to increasingly catch up and employees at a firm with fewer than 100 employees are outpacing uh, the freelance independent workers that co-working was originally created to serve. So if you take a look at these stats, companies with more than 1,000 employees now make up uh, about 20% of WeWork membership and 30% of sales, and that number is growing dramatically. And one example is IBM took space in Manhattan from WeWork, and it was sort of a landmark case. Um, they actually rented a couple of, leased a couple of um, full private floors, and other companies are doing the same thing. Amazon and all kinds of different companies are now moving into WeWork spaces because it gives them the opportunity to have a short-term commitment and instant flexibility so they can come in and just move a whole bunch of people into a space without having all of the uh, build-out required. WeWork takes care of all of that. And I think one of the interesting uh, complaints that sometimes you hear or reservations maybe is a better word is that companies can kind of lose their corporate identity in a WeWork space, but it's a, an interesting experiment to see if uh, employees can 
be more productive in those spaces, if it helps to attract and retain talent, um, or if it's too much competition nearby and they're likely to lose more employees. Either way, it's an interesting experiment to see what kind of ROI it brings to a company uh, between the pros and the cons. So um, here are some other examples of uh, real, some really interesting um, companies that are doing some really interesting work in uh, real estate fracking, if you will. Um, some that are renting desks, some that are renting hotel rooms by the minute, some that are doing uh, at hotel rooms as an office, some that have, uh, you know, they're renting um, pop-up storefronts and uh, space in restaurants for meetings when the restaurants are closed between you know, three and five, and all kinds of different interesting examples that are making it um, very easy to think about how your space is, what it, your space is made up of. Um, and so it'll be curious to see how that evolves. So another interesting trend is that technology is causing a huge shift in value from physical assets to user experiences. And again, that's somewhat being driven by what millennials want. Um, and it's not as much for the for the workforce. It's not as much about the building and the community and that kind of thing as it used to be in some cases, since uh, they're looking for the experience uh, that the community can provide them. So is there that live, work, play experience? What is it like within the workforce? workplace ex itself and how much control do they have over their own space, their own heat and things like that. So if you look at some of these um, startups, you start to see things that like Comfy that really let you, um, you know, have control over your individual workspace and the temperature and the lighting and things like that. And of course, uh, Internet of Things being very connected and um, your employers also have a certain amount of control over these things. And so, again, it's we're just sort of at the tipping point of these technologies, but it will be interesting to see how all of this continues to evolve. Um, and with AI and machine learning, which a lot of these startup um, companies are built on, AI uh, and machine learning is, is really changing a lot of how this work is done and also um, what it means to track and have control over the data about each one of us when we're in the workforce, when we're out in the workplace, when we're just going for a jog with our smartphones. So the amount of data that is being created about us and um, the amount of, of how useful, I guess, that data is because of AI and machine learning is really an amazing trend in and of itself. And just for clarification, um, AI being artificial intelligence, so uh, the intelligence exhibited by machines and algorithms, which is generally static, and then machine learning, which is basically um, AI based on learning patterns as opposed to task-specific algorithms. So the machine learns without being explicitly programmed when exposed to new data. And these tools have increasingly uh, crept into our daily lives um, and begun to integrate into our daily lives without us even realizing. So we're all using Amazon to shop. We're all using ways to get, you know, through our streets and our commutes and everything we do. We're talking to Siri. We're using Google Translate. These are all examples of AI and machine learning. And so given how they've so dramatically integrated into our daily lives, of course it makes sense that they will be moving into the workplace as well. Um, and just to, just to go back to that for one second, 
um, rural, suburban, or urban, your communities need to be able to provide the uh, infrastructure that these different technologies need to function. So, you know, high speed internet, broadband access, um, all of this, it doesn't matter what, what type of community you have, this is all very, very important for um, being able to be successful and attract both talent and companies. So if you look at some of the, the companies that are really um, enabled by AI and machine learning, um, there are a lot of companies on here that are doing some really interesting things with, uh, with these technologies. And I threw Statebook into here because even we're starting to get in on some of the action. And, um, you know, some companies now are are teaching AI to read leases and be able to do predictive analytics for companies. And we are now starting to engage with companies at Statebook to determine if we can uh, work with them to start track tracking their existing locations and where their workforce is through our platform and then using our data to understand market trends and as le leases approach, should they renew, should they um, continue to st stay in a specific location or does it make sense for them to uh, look for another location based on workforce trends, et cetera. So all some really interesting stuff coming down the pike. So if you think about um, the data explosion that this is all causing, the penetration of AI and robotics will be close to 100% in many areas, according to Mark Prensky, the director of Global Future Education Foundation and Institute. It will be similar to the penetration of cell phones today. Over two thirds of the world now has them and uses them daily. So if you think about what that means for your communities, um, industrial, the industrial industry is one of the uh, biggest, obviously, to be um, capturing this this part of the industry, and everybody kind of thinks about uh, life sciences and the automotive industry. You can see here an example of the automotive industry being sort of roboticized, and um, of course, if you also think about the fact that cows now come in and milk themselves in Iowa. I know our uh, chief economist is in Iowa and he says, yep, the cows come in, they milk themselves, they just come in and automatically hook up to um, milk machines and it's an amazing thing. And now they're even talking about having automated tractors that the farmer can just control from his smartphone and they go out and do the work. And uh, obviously that doesn't negate the need for the farmer, but it does make the farmer's job different and more efficient. And so, again, whether you're a rural community, suburban or urban, you need to enable the infrastructure that supports these technologies. And this is actually a photo of um, the Catskill Mountains where I live and a little community near where I live. And, um, even the Catskills, which will never be quote unquote a smart city, needs to have the infrastructure to enable people to from New York City to come out to the mountains to be able to connect while they're there, whether they're up on a hike at the top of a mountain or just in town. And let me tell you, in a lot of the communities there, they're definitely, ha they have a long way to go, but then again, there are companies like Statebook that are being born in these areas and rural areas and then enabled to work from anywhere. So um, it is a, an important piece to understand for going forward. And so autonomous transit is another really big factor here. And um, I think with autonomous transit, there is uh, a lot to know. Google's Waymo um, has 150 autonomous taxis in Phoenix now, in Pittsburgh and Schenectady and Syracuse, New York. Um, they're also doing autonomous transit already. 
Volvo has promised Uber over 24,000 autonomous taxis in 2019. And um, so, you know, there's a, a tremendous amount of, of uh, movement in this area. And obviously you even have companies like Google now talking about flying cars, which takes it to a whole nother level. Um, but, uh, you know, truck trucking obviously is one of the biggest uh, industries that will be disrupted. So, um, and that is already happening in some areas. And I didn't, wasn't able to put the photo in, but um, in Dubai, they've already mobilized their police force on uh, basically their jet skis that fly through the air, <laughs> kind of like the Jetsons. So, and then they are already mobile and in the air. So it's really an amazing um, part of the industry and how it affects communities is um, also very interesting. In the urban United States, the automobile consumes close to 50% of the land area in cities. And in LA, that figure approaches two thirds. So if you think about what that means for communities as autonomous vehicles start to become more ubiquitous, um, it really starts to speak to what do you do with all of the street infrastructure? What do you do with all of the parking infrastructure? And how can that be consolidated and additional land perhaps opened up for more parks or additional development? Because autonomous vehicles also may not be owned by everybody doesn't need an autonomous vehicle. So in that case, you start to think about if, ever, if more and more people are sharing vehicles because it doesn't make sense to own one, and those vehicles can be multi-purposed instead of being parked in a garage all day while you're at work, they can be running around and picking up lots of other people, then um, it begs the question of what happens to that 50% of land area and how much of that can be repurposed again for parks or additional development, et cetera. And so some communities are actually building themselves from the ground up with these types of thought patterns in mind from uh, Lake Nona in Florida, which is being built as a, as a fully um, transferable, let's use that word, uh, smart city to Union Point just south of Boston, about 20, 30 minutes south of Boston, which is also being built as a smart city from the ground up. And then co communities like Columbus, Ohio, which won the Department of Transportation Smart City Award last year for the innovation that they are doing, or Denver, Colorado, which is, um, which is partnered with um, Panasonic and doing smart city construction at the Denver International Airport and just outside of there. And so a lot of communities are starting to think about what does this, these, what do these new technologies mean for the planning and land use of our communities and how we develop them and how people need to access them and get around them and so forth. So there's a lot of interesting conversation going on around the country with regards to uh, smart cities and and how um, autonomous vehicles play into that. Some other interesting case studies that we can think about are um, augmented reality and virtual reality, and of course, robots. You can see in this picture here, companies are building more and more types of technology for uh, specific to real estate in these areas. So you can tour buildings that are not yet built. Um, you can imagine them almost in reality. And it gives you remote and real-time control of operations. And some of those startups that we looked at earlier are really uh, out there doing this work and um, making the uh, impossible actually possible. <laughs> And um, there is actually some amazing work being done around robotic buildings and robotic construction as well. And 
fully autonomous buildings, who knows? They're not going to get up and move themselves around. But I know in Dubai, um, Accenture has a building, their showcase building. Every, their employees wake up to a, their own personal robot who gives them all of their information that they need for the day. And then they go off and do their work with the robot by their side. They escort them to the office and they tell them today you'll be in office, you know, third floor office B because we've already done the work ahead of time to coalesce all of the people that you need to meet with in one area. And so you all have, you know, meeting rooms near each other centered around this conference room for this day. And tomorrow you might be on a completely different floor and your personal robot is giving you all of the information that you need about each person you're meeting with, what the topics are, et cetera, et cetera. And so a lot of the work is, is literally being done for you. But then, of course, human intervention and, and human know-how and and interaction, of course, is at the center point of that, both in uh, increasing people's quality of life and then their ability to work in many ways. So all of that is very interesting. This is a really cool slide. I was at MIT last year and I had the opportunity to see several different types of construction materials that actually build themselves. And while this is not ready to be fully deployed yet, it is fascinating to watch it in real life in action. And so in this case, these cool boulder looking building blocks, um, they're multifaceted. They have some kind of little tiny microscopic computer brain in them. And so imagine if there was an earthquake and part of the bridge truss um, collapsed and in, a few hours you could deliver, maybe by drone technology in the future, you could deliver a, um, a few boxes of these things and they came in and you opened them up and they were already pre-programmed with what the bridge used to look like and they could just come and you know build themselves into a truss that would hold it up until more permanent uh, construction could could be in place, but at least it's it's there, it's instant, and you have a quick fix. I saw this type of um, building material working at MIT and also some really cool wire frame. They're like individual wires and they just build themselves into these little building blocks as you watch them. So it's really amazing what they can do with construction these days and um, how how fast technology is moving in these directions. And of course, they're already 3D printing houses in, uh, in this is in Dubai, but um, they are 3D printing houses now in third world countries. There are several nonprofits that are doing it and they can do it as inexpensively as $3,500 a house. So you can imagine if you're um, in a community that's been hit by a disaster and they can come in and 3D print a bunch of houses in a matter of weeks to shelter people that are, you know, covered and, and actually quite functional and nice inside um, for $3,500 each. It changes the game on how people start to think about construction, how people um, are able to recover from disasters and many other um, as yet unknown types of solutions that these might enable. So um, I'm going to go through just a couple of key takeaways and then I would love to open this up as a dialogue and um, hear from, from questions from the audience and start to um, have a little bit more of a conversation. So uh, as I go through the last few slides, think about questions and be entering them into uh, the, the GoToWebinar control panel so that we can have a little bit more of a dialogue. I would really love to hear from you about um, some of the questions that you have and, and how some, you're seeing some of these trends impact your communities. 
So some of the key takeaways include uh, real estate fracking and moving toward real estate as a service as opposed to the more traditional types of real estate infrastructure that we're used to seeing. Um, companies are extracting value from asset optimization as a result of this. Uh, we are working with some companies that are actually starting to look at their own uh, occupancy rates and starting to work with companies like WeWork, thinking, well, if we have all of this excess real estate, um, you know, do we want to just engage uh, WeWork to come in and take over a few floors in our own buildings and rent those out so that we can have some of the innovation from tech startups close to home? And that can help feed the innovation at our company as well. And others, as I mentioned earlier, are more going more along the lines of renting, you know, getting rid of some of their existing space, which is in many cases for some of these legacy companies outdated or in communities that they don't feel are as attractive to the millennial worker as maybe they should be. And um, so they're really working to refocus and, and think about where they want to be and what they want to do with their space. Do they, Does it make sense? to switch to a WeWork type of space and so forth. Not all together, of course, but as an augmented piece of what they do. Um, and then the increasing importance of workforce and real estate. So how is that workforce really um, influencing the real estate that corporates are taking and looking for and the types of communities that they want to be in and so forth? Um, another really interesting point, the increased transaction velocity, which is being lubricated by technology. So, you know, with technologies and the, you know, CoStar has been the, the big uh, technology provider for all of the commercial real estate around the United States and increasingly around the world. And they've got a monopoly on that, but there are a lot of young challengers coming in to challenge different areas of their monopoly and, um, you know, looking at different aspects of the business that they might be able to do more quickly and nimbly and giving companies much more access to information about their own leases, about the availability of space about the types of communities that they might want to be in and so forth. So it's um, that, that increased transaction velocity being lubricated by technology is a really important one. And of course, all of the increasing amounts of data that these technologies are enabling. And I think we've only barely begun to think about what that enables us to do, all of that data. And we're only just beginning to start to harness a lot of that data. The majority of that data is still unharnessed and untapped, but increasingly it's becoming more and more organized as a lot of these technologies spring forth. And so it will be, again, a big influencer going forward. AI and machine learning enabling better decision-making, um, smarter, faster, we'll see where this industry goes and um, what kinds of technologies are enabled by it. I think we're sort of on the very fringe of the Wild West frontier with a lot of this technology. And so it'll be interesting again to see where that goes and something to watch. And then moving very quickly through the startup cycle. And what I mean by that is um, startups are popping up all over the place, being funded by that really increasingly rich capital that is being made available to this industry. But as much as there is a proliferation of startups in the space, there's also a lot of coalescing of those technologies happening at the, at the commercial real estate end. So commercial real estate firms, CBRE leading the charge and followed closely by JLL and um, Collier's, Newmark a little bit, 
Cushman's sort of thinking about it now they that they just come or sort of in the midst of their IPO. Um, but, uh, you know, these big real estate companies don't want to be left behind, of course. And so they're acquiring a lot of these firms and, and the startups are frankly acquiring each other. And so at the end, I think you'll see some of the, the winners coming out on top and starting to create more of a presence for themselves and become more known across the industry and even out in your communities in some cases. So some final thoughts about what technology brings to the table, um, certainly improving people's quality of life and providing better access to jobs and lot ladder there's an opportunity, so you can imagine if you have a community, um, say say a small to medium-sized city or even a large city that is enabled by autonomous transit, and suddenly people have a lot more access to jobs, to education, to healthcare, to childcare, and all of them enables all of that enables them to have better quality of life and start to, you know, move up the ladder, but still be able to live outside of the city center, perhaps, um, and still access everything that the city has to offer, it becomes very interesting as you start to uh, streamline the accessibility between the more rural areas and the opportunities in the city. And they start to, a lot of people are, are predicting that they may start to really work more smoothly and in balance with the efficiency that things like autonomous transit enable instead of having traffic jams you have autonomous transit that can go back and forth enabling more people to have access to all of the opportunities that the city has to offer and that can create much more sustainability in rural and suburban communities that didn't exist in the past and again those uh, upward mobility for employees and driving growth in the overall economy. And as um, Mayor Ginther said, transportation is not just about roads, transit, and ride sharing. It's about how people access opportunity and how they live, which is a very nice quote. And so for final thought, um, given that we never really seem to know what is going to happen, especially with technology growing at such a hyper speed right now. Um, I love this Bill Gates quote, which is, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Bill Gates. So with that, Thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, I will be very glad to answer questions that you may have. I see that um, there are several um, questions that are already in the queue, so I'll start to um, I'll start to look through those, and maybe we can answer a few of them. Here's one. Um, do you envision co-working stations will show up in suburban areas or is the business model only profitable in an urban setting? Having locations in the suburbs can help cut down on traffic issues and commute times. I personally absolutely envision co-working stations in suburban areas and even in rural areas. Um, I showed you that uh, photo of the Catskill Mountains and in the Catskills, where uh, there's a lot of discussion among developers there, and trust me, there is not a lot of developer development there. And any for anyone who is on the line who is not familiar with the Catskill Mountains, they're about two and a half hours outside of Manhattan, and the closest uh, city is a small city of 25,000, Kingston, New York, which was the first capital of New York State, and um, in the little hamlet where where I have a house, there are only about four or five hundred people, and we're still talking about putting in a co-working space there because people come up through, throughout the year, um, in the summers, in the fall, to see foliage, to ski in the winter, et cetera, 
and they spend a week or two at a time or even just a long weekend with their families and they need access to quiet spaces where they can work. And right now it's the library where you can get Wi-Fi and uh, that kind of thing. But um, I think co-working spaces will proliferate all over. And uh, I don't think that it will be specifically limited to um, urban areas at all. So um, let me see what uh, other questions I may answer. In order to be competitive with the metro areas, we have seen rural communities do draw more technology forward companies. And we work, oh, what have we seen? What have we seen rural communities do? Sorry, my mistake. To draw more technology forward companies and we work type companies. Um, so I think the answer to this question goes back to uh, the earlier thoughts about, you know, ensure your last mile connectivity is in place. I think that's increasingly important. I know for myself, I had to run the last three poles from the street up to my property in order to have high speed internet. And I was fortunate that I was able to do that. But if, if you have that infrastructure in space in place and you are able to provide the capital that startups need, um, these kinds of these kinds of things, both connectivity and access to capital are two of the most important things. Obviously, access to talent is another very, very important one. Um, and one of the things that we do at Statebook is we work with communities all the time to be able to come in to use our platform to say, okay, here are all of the industries in our area. Here is where our people are employed today. Here are the types of degrees that our nearby universities are graduating today. And if you then look at through a platform like indeed.com or monster.com what are the uh, what are the jobs that our employers are actually posting for you can start to identify where those gaps may lie the skills gaps and you can start to think about what kinds of talent you might want to um, work with your universities to ensure that they're making available in the community so I think access to talent, access to capital, and putting together your infrastructure. And then there are all kinds of amazing uh, sort of quick fix solutions for your communities that can really jazz up a community. So if you look at the kinds of companies, um, there's one that does sort of pop-up sidewalks. And they will come and literally overnight in one night, they will transform a city street or a town street with um, chalk to create a central, you know, walking area or sitting area or common area or redirecting traffic in certain ways that makes your community more walkable and livable and that kind of thing. And it doesn't take a big investment to be able to do a lot of these changes, incorporate changes that can very quickly overnight test if you can um, be more successful in your community and creating the kind of community that you want with very low overhead and, and quick, um, quick fixes. So um, that is, th those are just some of the things that you can do to start to um, attract these more technology forward companies. I know in our little city in Kingston, um, one of the things that they worked on was they realized that they had a little bit of a tech hub that was already starting. And so they started to coalesce leaders around it and they formed a, um, a, tech, a tech meetup for all of the technology startups in the area to be able to connect and find each other and grow. And as that grew, which now in a little city of 25,000, 
we serve the larger area and we have a tech meetup in our little city that now has more than 2,500 um, members and usually around 250 people or so at, at each tech startup, uh, tech meetup on a monthly basis. And at those meetings, now they've been so successful that the Economic Development Organization started bringing some of the tech startups together and doing marketing videos and um, putting together uh, promotional pieces that they then brought down to New York City to engage the tech meetups in New York City and start recruiting some of the tech entrepreneurs in New York City to come up, spend some time in their town in Kingston and meet some of the entrepreneurs that were already in Kingston. So there are a lot of um, really interesting ways that you can very easily and for l very little money um, start to identify and build the types of communities that you want to have. Um, so here's another question, which I think is very interesting. Um, it said, you implied that as real estate companies, we should figure out the type of workforce in our area. Um, and you also mentioned increased velocity of data makes it, makes it possible for us to know that. Um, can you suggest the best resources or to know what kinds of workers are moving into our area or how does one keep tabs on the movement of people across states, cities, or counties? Well, that is actually a perfectly, I, I should have paid one of my employees to write that question, but thank you to, <laughs> to the person that wrote it because it wasn't. Um, certainly you can use a platform like Statebook. So uh, if you're not familiar with our platform, we aggregate data around workforce and, and uh, wage rates and taxes and industries and utility rates and quality of life, all of the data that site selectors need to be able to make location-driven, data-driven decisions. And so you can use a platform like ours to understand at a glance, literally in minutes, all of the different assets that your community has. And um, there are other data sets, of course, too, that give you, uh, which are free from the government, that give you access to some of this information, like the IRS migration data set and um, you can really see where workers are moving to and from and get a, a really good handle on that. Um, and these are all of the types of tools that companies are using, that um, site selectors are using, and um, companies are using for foreign direct investment and so forth. And I'd be happy to have a conversation with you about that. Um, offline as well if there's interest there in learning more. So here's a really one of my favorite questions on these topics is um, won't there be a point where all of the labor intensive jobs will be done by robots and people will not have to leave their homes for anything? What will this do to commercial real estate? So I think um, it's, it's definitely uh, a misnomer to think that all we have to do is is train robots and AI and machine learning and then eventually all we have to do is you know write poetry and take walks and <laughs> get a tan um, but uh, I, I do not think that there is a point where um, all the jobs will be done by robots I do think that a lot of the as you put it, a lot of the labor intensive jobs will be done by robots, but they still require people to manage the robots, to fix the machines, to come up with the machines. And um, there's a, there is a, a point in human development at each stage of human development where people think that, you know, these machines are going to take over the world. It happened with the Industrial Revolution, it happened with the, when computers were uh, 
introduced and you know we thought that they would be able to do all of the work for us and now it's happening again with ro robots and automation and that kind of thing but no i don't foresee a future where that is happening um i think that uh that there will be um a lot of uh i think that people are very good at reinventing themselves and sort of morphing with the next generation um, into new capacities and, and new roles for ourselves. And they say that having grown up on video games and texting, our kids are, their brains are actually wired differently. And so, you know, they're already starting to think and act in new ways that we sometimes don't understand. But um, I think I do not see a future where people will not be required for work uh, and certainly I think that especially for service um, occupations that is also true although there are still many service applications like attorneys they're saying are some of the first that will be disrupted I won't say replaced at all but I will say disrupted and um, healthcare providers because some of that can be done by um, computers and machine learning and and that kind of thing in terms of diagnosing things early on and also even just having access to medical problems and medical data from all around the world. So I think there are a lot of opportunities that these technologies will enable us to continue to think up and dream up new solutions to help us evolve with higher qualities of life and um, also I'm sure pl plenty of plenty of problems that will come from that as well so I think we're um, running short on time here and uh, I want to thank everybody for joining the webinar and um, Certainly, again, happy to follow up um, at any point if you would like to have a conversation at another point. I am Calandra at statebook.com and happy to have this conversation in greater detail. Thank you and have a great day, everybody.